Professor Clements with you. We're going to talk about a big subject today, cosmology, a description of the nature of the whole universe and the history of the universe. So we'll be covering some uh, concepts like why are the galaxies moving? And we're not going to totally answer that question in this video, but we'll, we'll give some uh, background, some possible answers. Uh, but why are the galaxies moving? Why is the sky not bright in every direction, night and day? If we look out, if the universe is infinite, we should be, uh, eventually, the direction we look should, should be a star, if the universe is infinite. So we'll, we'll talk about, the, and, and we'll answer that question today. Then we'll talk about the age of the universe, an estimate of the age of the universe. So uh, the cosmology here, we're taking the big picture now. We've talked about galaxies. We've talked about clusters of galaxies and clusters of clusters, you know, the super clusters. Um, we have a little bit more to do yet, especially regarding motion and what's occurring there, and the age of the universe. So did the universe have a beginning? Um, there's scientific evidence that it did, and we won't talk about all that evidence today, but we'll, we'll get a, a little hint at it. And what's going to happen in the future? What's the universe going to look like in the future? And we won't answer that question today. It's, cosmology is a large subject, more than uh, you want to listen to in one lecture. But first, let's talk about motion. Some of the concepts that we experience on Earth, if we uh, throw something up, a baseball, an apple, a football, um, a pin, and uh, what we do is we observe it goes up for a while and then it comes back down. So that's happening near the earth, where, and we have a little limitation. Our arms or feet cannot propel something at a speed where it will escape from the earth. So what goes up must come down. That applies near the earth to low speed objects. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the galaxies. So the galaxies, we, we have this recession velocity we've talked about before. They're moving away from each other. They're going up. Will they stop sometime and come back down? Why, why aren't the galaxies just dominated by gravity force and the galaxies pull back together into one object? Well, taking a look at uh, how this question might be resolved, why are the galaxies not just in one lump at uh, some location? Uh, one could be perhaps the universe is infinite in extent. If that's the case, then here's our galaxy of interest in the middle. And there are an infinite number of galaxies to the left. There are an infinite number of galaxies to the right. And they will, their force of gravity will balance each other. And the galaxies won't go towards one particular place. All galaxies would have zero net force on them. If there's an infinite number of galaxies in every direction, then the net force is going to be zero, and there's no tendency then to come back down, if you want to say that. Uh, so that's, that's one possibility. Or we might be living at a time right now, and we see the galaxy speed you know, greater than the escape velocity from the gravitational pull that's available from all the mass in the universe. You know, is that the case? Or, are these clusters of galaxies uh, having a speed that's uh, greater than the, the pull of gravity back towards some place? Um, that's, you know, that's an idea, that's a possibility. And again, this video is not going to totally answer that question. Or we might be you know, living at a time now when we uh, are looking at the expansion part. We're looking at the galaxies going up, and we haven't reached this place where they're going to stop moving and, and come back down. You know, that's, that's a thought. Or there might be some other explanation, and it turns out it's something else, and that'll be in a future video. Uh, but we do see the galaxies in motion. Um, just wanted to touch on that in this video, and we'll have more on that in a future video. Now, let's talk now about the Olber's Paradox. Olber's Paradox, and um, this goes back into the 1800s and earlier, 1700s to uh, and earlier, this idea of some, pe some people thinking uh, they're seeing stars on the sky. If there are more stars out there, uh, eventually, would you look in a direction and eventually you see a star where you're looking? You know, wouldn't that make the, scar, the sky bright? If the universe is infinite, you know, that uh, solution one to uh, why aren't the galaxies in a lump, um, that the universe is infinite, we get a zero net force on the pull of the galaxies in every direction. Um, so if the universe is infinite, if that's the solution, wouldn't the uh, 
whole sky night and day be as bright as a star. If there's, there's infinite material uh, away from us in every direction, as we look in a direction, we should hit a star. And we'll, we'll, there'll be a little diagram in a minute on that. <clears throat> but consider this. We, uh, in this course before, we've talked about how the brightness of some object gets uh, less as the uh, distance increases. It turns out to be proportional to the square of the distance. The brightness decreases, so if we're twice as far away, we're four times less bright. If we're three times farther away, we're nine times less bright, three squared. If we're four times further away, we're 16 times less bright. Um, so the brightness of an object does get less as the distance increases by the square. But it turns out that the number of galaxies that uh, would be out there is proportional to the square of the distance. So let's get to a little diagram on that in a minute. But um, So... Olbers, uh, 1823, it's credited with Olbers making this statement, <coughs> but uh, there are people making this statement earlier than that. So if we have an infinite universe and we don't see a star, we know that dust is important in blocking light in the Milky Way and uh, from other galaxies. What, what if there's dust in between the galaxies, dust in between the clusters of galaxies, could this prevent us from looking in a direction and seeing bright light? Well, you have to consider that the universe is very old. If this light is falling on the dust and being absorbed by the dust, what's going to happen to the temperature of that dust? It's absorbing energy. It's, it's look, the dust is seeing a star off to uh, the far side of the dust from our point of view. So the dust uh, is seeing a star. It's being warmed up by that starlight, and eventually that dust will become the same temperature as the star. Um, so that's not a solution. We'd, we'd look out, maybe we wouldn't see a star, but we would see hot dust every place we look. So no, that, that's not the reason. It's not dust that's blocking us. And here's this description. If we have one galaxy per square, as we look further away, uh, the number of galaxies will increase as the square of the distance. Though the brightness is decreasing, um, you know, we divide by the square of the distance, but the number of galaxies is going up as the square of the distance, and those two effects cancel. Um, so we would, you know, this is not the solution for Olber's paradox. This is saying why Olber's paradox exists. The stars do get less bright with distance, but we've got more stars or galaxies. So the fact that the stars or galaxies are further away is not a solution to Olber's paradox. The fact that these points of light are further away does not explain why the sky is not bright at night. Because there would be more, there would be compensating more galaxies or stars um, as we look further away to make up for how the galaxies or stars are getting dimmer. I hope that's uh, somewhat clear. With distance, the light gets dimmer, but with distance we get more stars or more galaxies. Those two effects compensate, and this is not the solution for Olber's paradox. This uh, compensating effect would say we'd have just the same brightness every place we look, every distance we look. So, we look out, Olber's paradox says, yeah, eventually we're going to see a star or galaxy should be bright as a star every place we look. Um, so, here is sort of a visualization. This is an animated GIF, but it's not animating. Um, this visualization starts with just one star and then there are more and more stars as we uh, sense objects that are further away and eventually you just get a whole sky full of stars so you know, it didn't pan out quite as well as I hoped there. The Hubble uh, telescope looking at the extreme deep field and again you're not seeing brightness filling in this uh, this picture. There are regions where we're not getting energy um, all, all across here um, Olber's paradox says we should be getting a, just a just a uniform screen of brightness here in this picture, but that doesn't happen. So what's the solution? Well, you know that we have this recession effect. The galaxies are receding from us, and they're receding faster the farther away they are. What happens to the color of the light? Well, it's a red shift. The wavelengths are going towards the red end of the spectrum. Which type of light has more energy? blue light or red light? 
and it is the red light. Off to the blue end and violet and ultraviolet, so that's high energy and x-rays in that part of the spectrum. But over here we get red, then we get infrared, then we get radio waves, and you know, you're not harmed by the remote uh, control of your TV if you point it at your hand. Uh, that infrared beam doesn't have enough energy to ionize uh, atoms in your in your skin, so you're safe with that. But you don't want to point an ultraviolet light at your skin for long periods of time because that will give you a sunburn and be da dangerous. So we have this recession velocity. The light waves are being shifted towards low energy. And there's the solution for Olber's paradox. We're receiving very low energy light from the v numerous multiple distant galaxies and stars. And that's why our, our sky is not bright. The light that's coming to us gets shifted towards the red end. So the expansion of space carrying along stars and galaxies produces redshift. The red light has less energy than the blue light that uh, it, the star galaxy emitted. So the sky is not bright at night. We don't see energy across the sky. That energy has been redshifted to a realm that uh, is low energy and we don't have a star surface filling the sky. So solution to Olber's paradox, expansion of space. So you ought to write down some questions and ask your instructor. I'm going to continue here in, the, in this video with expansion. So general relativity, Einstein developed this around 1916 and the equations don't allow for a static universe, so expanding or contracting. When the natural thing is, you know, things go up, things come down. The uh, natural thing is that there would be some contraction of the universe in the future. Um, when Einstein came up with general relativity, the universe was thought to be stationary, static, not expanding or contracting. So general relativity uh, would say that in some point the universe is going to contract. Einstein uh, arbitrarily, without uh, you know, experiments or something to, to uh, inform him, uh, put in what's called the cosmological constant. I won't call it exactly a force to uh, work against gravity, but the idea is, in a simple terms, and general relativity is more complicated than this, but in simple terms, gravity is trying to compress the universe back down. The cosmological constant keeps it going outward, counterbalancing gravity. So the cosmological constant is put there to create a balance to allow general relativity to predict a static universe that is the uh, uh, was the understanding of astronomers in 1916. Um, of course we have uh, measurements coming about, the redshift and recession velocity being measured um, around this time and afterwards better measurements. So Hubble collected this data on distance to galaxies and the recession velocity and astronomers uh, came to the conclusion, they revised their statement saying the universe was static, they revised it to say the universe was expanding. The universe is expanding and the cosmological constant was just arbitrarily dropped from the equations of general relativity. And Einstein said it was one of the greatest mistakes he ever made. It turns out, future video, it wasn't such a great mistake. Uh, we'll, we'll get to something similar to cosmological constant. So keep that in your in your mind. So again, I'll write down some questions here on uh, expansion of the universe and cosmological constant and uh, just sort of scratching the surface here. It's kind of introduction to cosmology. What about the age of the universe? We've talked about expansion. What about age? So if something's expanding, um, does that have some implication for a beginning and an age for the universe? How old do you think the universe is? And tell your neighbor some, uh, some reason for that. And throw in a little science there. That would be good. Well, we go back to Hubble's constant. It's going to give us a way to estimate the age of the universe. And this is a crude estimate. This is not uh, the best way to estimate the age of the universe, but a crude way. Consider this common relationship. The distance equals rate times time. If we travel at 50 miles an hour for three hours, we'll be 150 miles away from where we started. So distance equals rate times time. The 
we do observe the galaxies are some distance away from each other right now. And that implies there's been expansion going on for some period of time. Uh, the distance we have expanded, there's a rate of expansion, and there's an age to the universe. The distance equals rate times time. Okay, if I do this uh, relationship here, but I want to find the age of the universe, I want to find the time this motion has been going on, then I divide both sides by rate. So the time would be the distance divided by the rate. Now let's take a look at Hubble's law. We have a rate here, the velocity, recession velocity. We have Hubble's constant, we have distance. So can I reformulate this and get it in the form of distance divided by rate? Yes, I can. If I divide both sides by h, and I divide both sides by v, then the h's will cancel on the right side, the v's will cancel on the left side, and I'll have 1 over the Hubble constant equals distance divided by rate. This is time. 1 over h gives us time. And you have to do a lot of conversion of units that we're not going to do in this course, but if we put in an h value of 21 kilometers per second per million light years, so you have to get the millions of light years into kilometers, um, will come out and you convert seconds to years, then you'll come out with an age roughly of 14 billion years for the universe. Hubble's law in, and the Hubble constant implies that the universe has been expanding for 14 billion years. That's our rough age back to the starting point. So time here, distance divided by rate, we're going to use time as the age of the universe. And when we come down here, 1 over the Hubble constant then, this distance divided by rate, 1 over the Hubble constant gives us an age for the universe, an estimate for the age of the universe. And you might think, uh, you know, Hubble's constant, it's been revised slightly over the years. Um, what would happen if the Hubble constant was a larger number? It would be traveling at greater speed out to the distance we observe now with the galaxies. If the Hubble constant was larger, then we get a smaller age for the universe. If the Hubble constant is smaller, if the universe has been expanding slower, then <clears throat> we'll get a longer time back to the beginning, uh, a longer age, a greater age for the universe. Because if the expansion rate was smaller, then it takes more time to get to the observed distances for the galaxies today. So Hubble constant allows an estimate of the age of the universe. It's not a precise number, but an estimate. So let's say we have 21 uh, kilometers per second, um, and we go up to 30. So 1 over 21 versus 1 over 30. If we're dividing by a bigger number, then we're going to get a smaller number for the age. And again, the reasoning for that space is if, if h is a bigger number, then space is expanding faster. It takes a shorter time. You know, if you travel on the interstate at 50 miles an hour from point A to point B, that takes a certain amount of time. If you travel at 70 miles per hour, hope that's legal where you drive, then it takes a shorter time to go from point A to point B. What if we're smaller for our, our speed here, or for the Hubble constant, which is related to the speed of expansion? But if the Hubble constant is smaller, then the universe you know, takes longer to get to where we observe it now for those distances. So if you go from point A to B at 45 miles an hour rather than 50, it's going to take you longer to get there. Um, your age would be greater if you have a certain age. Let's say, you hope this doesn't happen too often, but uh, a baby is born in a car at point A and driving you know, 200 miles, it's very hypothetical, and uh, at 50 miles an hour, the baby would be a certain age when we get to point B. If we drive at 45 miles an hour, the baby would be older when we get to point B. So the universe has a certain observed size. Uh, this rate uh, is related to the age of the universe. And I'm not going to do any calculations of that, just the concept. If the Hubble constant is larger, it implies the universe is expanding faster. Our age is smaller. It's taking less time to get to where we are. And if H is smaller, then our age estimate is larger. The universe is older. So write down some questions on that, and uh, that's going to be where we wrap up things today in this video. We talked about expansion of the universe. The galaxies are moving away from each other, not in a lump. Um, so partial 
reasoning and uh, there will be more to come on why that's the case. Talked about Olber's paradox, why the sky is not bright in all directions, night and day. And it's due to the expansion of the universe, making the light weaker, making the light less energetic, the redshift that's, uh, that's occurred there. And then age of the universe, a rough estimate with the Hubble's constant we have. Rough estimate is 14 billion years ago this expansion started. And we have the galaxies now, now at their separations. It's, it's much more complicated than that for the motions of the galaxy and uh, doing the age of the universe, but that's a rough estimate. So um, write down some questions, ask your instructor.